Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters, boys and girls. Hope you had a good weekend. In this uh, devotional song that you just heard in Karuna Didi's melodious voice, uh, she was uh, paying a tribute to Sri Aurobindo and uh, talking about his incomparable character. He was a spiritual master who gave a new meaning to words, coined new phrases, and uh, what is most important to each of us as individuals is that uh, anyone who turned to him found uh, solace, discovered through him a path of yoga that didn't have any sorrow but instead had bliss. Bliss and or ananda was one of the favorite sort of themes of Sri Aurobindo because he wanted to bring out that bringing spirituality into our life is not something which is dull and monotonous, which we have to do as a sort of a duty, something which will help us uh, uh, in some other world or uh, gain the blessings of the divine and so on and so forth and therefore for that make a serious business out of it, even if it involves a lot of agony. What he demonstrated was that uh, turning to this path, although that may not be the goal, but is in our own interest because it also gives us all those things that we are looking for, including bliss which goes many, many steps ahead of uh, the ordinary happiness that we are all looking for. And uh, then she talked about uh, the surrender. The one who takes refuge in, in him and surrenders to him finds not only the right path, but if the person was miserable, was uh, help, feeling helpless, was running from pillar to post, suddenly finds that uh, when he takes refuge in him, or as she called it, in his temple, discovers there a golden chariot, which means not only uh, an abode, which is uh, golden, which means uh, something, you know, very precious as well as uh, beautiful and comfortable, but also it's a chariot, which means that the person starts traveling, the person starts traveling on a path that he had not imagined, that he had not thought of on his own, and now he is uh, on to a path that is both safe and meaningful where guidance will be always available to him from the Guru and uh, he can travel in that uh, comfort, feeling the love of the Divine communicated to him through the Guru and uh, be sure that now he's on the right path moving towards the genuine goal of life. So that is what this devotional song was about. Today we will be talking about Integral Yoga the yoga of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Uh, when we talk of Hatha Yoga, most people feel, yes, this looks like yoga. Because you, know, you see all the asanas and everything, that is what Hatha Yoga emphasizes. Raja Yoga, yes, again, now uh, uh, people feel, yes, meditation is also an important part of yoga, so this also feels like yoga. But uh, when we turn to the Gita, oh, is this also yoga? Talking about uh, uh, the three paths and the knowledge, devotion and action, it doesn't look so much to people like yoga, but then you saw the other day that that in fact is uh, what brings yoga into our everyday life and uh, that is what Sri Aurobindo's spirituality is also about and that is what suits most of us. That is what makes our life meaningful. That is also something that makes the asanas and the pranayamas and meditation more purposeful and a part of a spiritual discipline rather than be something which is being done just to stay fit. And now today we'll go one step further and see how Sri Aurobindo, leaning heavily on the yoga of the Gita, worked out a synthesis in which he also brought in the elements of the other traditional schools of yoga. And this was important because while the Gita does give us a lot that, uh, was, that took us beyond the techniques available in Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga, the yoga of the Gita, I mean if you read the scripture itself, does not tell you anything about the techniques. So that part is left out from there. And uh, at the most, you know, in chapter 6, you get some hints about how to meditate. But beyond that, the Gita does not talk about the techniques at all. Sri Aurobindo worked out a synthesis in which you find that the important elements of all the traditional schools of yoga are there. And uh, uh, for that, uh, I'll again turn to the slides. My humble pranam to the mother and Sri Aurobindo and their love and blessings to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram, Delhi branch. 
Uh, this course, yes, 0.01, is a part of the 150th birth anniversary celebrations of uh, Sri Aurobindo and uh, the 75th anniversary of India's independence. Uh, today our topic is uh, Integral Yoga, which is a part of uh, this current series in which we are talking about the different schools of yoga. Now, integral, as we have been talking in a few previous sessions also, means total or complete. And we shall see how it becomes complete. Uh, integral yoga is a synthesis. It's a powerful synthesis of the traditional schools of yoga, which Yorubindo worked out about a hundred years ago. And the most uh, uh, comprehensive text on integral yoga is the synthesis of yoga, which emerged from the Arya. Why did he have to work out this synthesis? The reason was uh, twofold. Firstly, that uh, when he was writing, and uh, since that exists even today to some extent, we can understand it. When he was writing uh, the outer form, that is the techniques or what is visible in yoga, had come to subordinate the spirit underlying yoga. While the classical texts of the traditional schools like Hatha Yoga, Raja Yoga, and so on, do talk about that underlying spirit in a very comprehensive manner, that had been forgotten and what had taken over was uh, the techniques which uh, help us stay fit and uh, the outer form had come to subordinate the spirit to such an extent that all the uh, clashes between different schools of yoga that had emerged were primarily about how exactly a technique is to be done and which are the techniques which are better and so on and so forth but the spirit underlying the outer form had been forgotten. The second reason why he had to work out the synthesis was that he realized a hundred years ago that yoga will no longer remain confined to the hermitages, to the few who uh, renounce worldly life and go and practice yoga in its uh, true spirit in the search of discovery of the divine. He saw at that time that the world is reaching a point where yoga will enter the common man's life. And uh, we find that exactly a hundred years after he wrote this, in 1914, in 2014, the world acknowledged it in a symbolic way by declaring the 21st of June as uh, the International Day of Yoga. So these were the two major reasons why he did it and therefore since I mean yoga was going to enter the common man's life, it was going to become immensely popular, it was important to uh, let people understand what truly yoga is about so that the spirit of yoga is preserved. Then what is a synthesis? In the first few pages of uh, the synthesis of yoga, Sri Aurobindo talks not only about why that synthesis is necessary, but also what actually a synthesis is. A synthesis, he says, is not uh, a combination. It's not just placing uh, the various elements that you want to synthesize side by side. For example, if a school of yoga says that uh, in our yoga, we have one hour of asanas and pranayamas a day, so we have done hatha yoga. Then we also have half an hour of meditation, so we have done raja yoga. And then we do some work as an offering to the divine, you know what is called in uh, different schools of yoga is uh, shramdan or karma yoga, one hour of karma yoga. It means disinterested service, something which you do, generally manual work for the ashram so that uh, uh, you, know, uh, you are also involved in some mechanical manual work which you are doing in a disinterested manner. So we do karma yoga. And uh, then we also have some lectures, we have some readings from scripture, so we have done jnana yoga. And then we spend one hour a day on devotional music, so we have done bhakti yoga, and so on. So you know, so the day is full of different types of yoga, uh, what we get from different types of yoga, so we can call it a synthesis. But that is not a synthesis. Just placing uh, different uh, types of uh, elements from different yoga side by side does not become a synthesis. Uh, so placing different types of yoga side by side is not a synthesis and the successive practice of different types of yoga is also not a synthesis which means that a person can't say that for five years I'll practice Hatha Yoga, next five years Raja Yoga, next five years Yoga of the Gita and therefore I have worked out a synthesis. That also is not a synthesis. Then if that is not a synthesis, what is a synthesis? A synthesis is one which takes into account the central principle of all the systems of yoga or all the systems of 
the elements that you are trying to synthesize because this can be generalized even beyond yoga anything any type of knowledge in which you are trying to work out a synthesis of uh, different types of specialization uh, specializations or different specialized schools if you are trying to work out a synthesis this is a very general principle which would apply and it's a very sort of valuable thing to keep in mind whenever we are trying to work out a synthesis be it in yoga or be it say in the field of medicine which has also today reached a point of uh, specialization to such an extent that a need for synthesis is being felt and all the things that you hear about like holistic medicine integrated medicine and family medicine and community medicine and uh, so on they all reflect an urge for that synthesis so this is a principle that can be kept in mind there also that a synthesis is one that takes into account the central principle of all systems of yoga in this case and what is that central principle self improvement taking us towards self perfection so that we can experience uh, realize a union with the divine so taking into account the central principles of all systems we then harmonize this this central principle with the unique features of each because each of the elements that you have selected for the synthesis naturally has something valuable to give so we take from it those unique features and with the help of these unique features and the central principle we work out a single harmonious entity that is what a true synthesis is so central principle of all systems of yoga is self improvement and uh, naturally self improvement should have a reference point improving in relation to what what we are where are we trying to take it to so the reference point is the divine and then that also becomes the goal because uh, starting from where we are and moving towards that reference point which is now our goal will be a journey but then we know at least in which direction we are uh, we have to move so now we are not just uh, drifting we are not uh, just uh, sort of Uh, groping in the dark we are clear about the goal and we are moving in that direction now let's see uh, the central principle of course of all systems is self improvement uh, with the intention of ultimately reaching a point of self perfection which is a quality or, or attribute of the divine and thereby achieving what we may call a union with the divine but then what are the particular features of different schools of yoga that sri aurobindo uh, considered the central feature of sorry sir unique feature of hatha yoga of course its central feature is the same as that of other yogas but the particular feature of hatha yoga is an emphasis on physical perfection and that is important because the body is our material base and that should be in a good shape for us to be able to bring into our life uh, the other elements of yoga or a spiritual path so we should not neglect the body we should take reasonably good care of for, of it so that it stays in good health and apart from diet and the other things which are important we can also use the techniques of hatha yoga in moderation so that uh, they have a place in our daily routine but not to such an extent that we are spending all 24 hours on uh, the techniques of hatha yoga with no time left to make use of that perfect body this particular feature of raja yoga is mental perfection which is also important because uh, the body and the mind work together in our life so the body mind complex should itself should be in good shape so once again from raja yoga we can uh, uh, take cues about working out a system of meditation uh, which suits us and uh, thereby uh, improve our ability to stay peaceful uh, and also to be able to concentrate better and think better then there is another major school of tantra yoga a rather controversial one but then sri aurobindo has taken that also into account because one of the major features of tantra yoga is that the divine can be approached through the world so not rejecting the world is a very strong feature in fact in tantra yoga and tantra yoga is the only school of yoga in which it is not the purush but the prakriti that is the manifest form of the divine which is emphasized that is the guiding sort of light is not purush but the prakriti so the divine can be approached through the world now the reason why it has earned a bad name is that you know one can stretch using rationality anything in a direction that appears tempting to us and therefore since the divine can be approached through the world anything that the divine has planted in us and forms a part of our normal nature which is an expression of the prakriti 
can be used for approaching the divine. After all, it's the divine that has planted in us also the urge for uh, uh, sex, for example. That sex instinct has been planted to us by, in us by the divine. So that can also be used for moving towards the divine. Uh, it's the divine that has placed in us also the elements of aggression. So that can also be used. So by sort of uh, uh, legitimizing to some extent elements like sex and violence, uh, some of the people who did not understand the true spirit of Tantra Yoga gave it a bad name. But uh, the basic principle still remains sound and uh, uh, that is something which Shorabindu has used in the synthesis that the divine can be approached through the world and therefore the world should not be rejected. Because this is one of the uh, basic elements of Vedanta which forms uh, the underlying feature of uh, all yogas that uh, the world is a manifestation of the divine and if the divine is real its manifestation cannot be unreal and we cannot accept just the unmanifest uh, that is one aspect of the divine and reject the other aspect that is the one which is manifest. So that would be irrational. Irrational. It would be irrational to reject one aspect of the divine that is the way the divine has made itself visible while considering the invisible form to be the only real form. So the world should not be rejected. The worldly life should not be rejected. But instead what we should do is to try and transform worldly life, transform human nature, and that is what will change the world because uh, if the human beings change, human nature changes, the world becomes a better place to live in. So uh, not rejecting the world and worldly life is one of the important elements in Sri synthesis. And then of course uh, it leans most heavily on the triple path of the yoga of the Gita. And from there some of the things we can say which uh, have been incorporated in the synthesis are that it is a highly student-centered path. It, uh, it tries to sort of guide the student on the path of yoga which is most in keeping with the inclinations and temperament of the student. And uh, along the same lines it also provides a wide range of possibilities in terms of the path that the student might take. <coughs> uh, the Three broad principles or rather three broad streams of the yoga of the Gita uh, are the are action, uh, knowledge and devotion. Now if you see it carefully, I mean a little reflect a little, you see that uh, uh, what else is there to do in fact except to use our instruments and our instruments are the body and the mind. So use the body to serve the best. So that is action. The mind has two aspects, feeling and thinking. So use your capacity to feel, to love that best. And uh, the other aspect of the mind is the intellect. Use the intellect to know the best. So knowing the best that is the divine, knowing the divine, adoring the divine and serving the divine. So our basic instruments, the body and the mind, any of these three can be pressed into service to pursue the divine and uh, which one we start with would depend upon the student. That choice has been left to the student and as we saw the other day while talking about the yoga of the Gita that uh, one can start with any of these three and if one continues long enough and sincerely enough one would end up practicing in fact all the three. The three would merge into one but uh, for the convenience of the student that, con that uh, flexibility has been provided the student can start along any path and in fact this freedom that has been given to the student expands to in a way a little further in integral yoga by not prescribing any particular path and let this, letting the student work out her own path in keeping with her not only ability and uh, inclinations but also the circumstances in life which means any type of life the person has uh, whatever role the person has in life is suitable for uh, walking along the path of integral yoga. Then it, all students are acceptable. Sri Krishna himself says in the Gita that there are four types of devotees, those who are miserable, those who want something, those who are knowledgeable, already know quite a bit about me and those who are 
curious to know me. They are inquisitive. All four types of devotees are acceptable to me. So all students are acceptable. Then there is an emphasis on direction, not on the destination. So the Gita gives us both. The destination, union with the divine, manmanabhava, be my minded. But at the same time, emphasis is not on that. The emphasis is on the direction. Direction, moving from tamas to rajas and from rajas to sattva. Tamas, you know, inertia, inertia and laziness, moving from there towards rajas, that is activity, maybe activity motivated by desires and ambitions, but doesn't matter, but it is better than being lazy. So from laziness towards activity and from activity towards enlightened activity, that is what sattva does. Sattva enlightens the activity. So the direction and the destination both are there. And the emphasis is not on the terminal point, that is the goal alone. And uh, then of course, it's compatible with worldly life. There's an emphasis in the Gita on action uh, throughout. That emphasis may be there, I mean, it may be more of an emphasis in the first one third of the Gita, but that does not disappear in the remaining two thirds. That only further uh, makes that action uh, more uh, divine oriented. That is how to approach the divine through action that comes emerges when one enlightens this action with knowledge which comes in this middle one-third of the Gita and then how this can be further lubricated by devotion which comes in the last one-third of the Gita. So that is a sort of a rough division but if we look at it as a whole it is compatible with worldly life and one of the important things that Sri Krishna says right in the second chapter is Yoga Sthakuru Karmani that is all your actions should be done while you are stationed in yoga, while you are situated in yoga. So while being in a poise of yoga, do all your actions. So all your actions includes all worldly life. Now let's see in light of this, what are some of the unique features of integral yoga. First is that it does not neglect the body. The body should be taken good care of and for that we can use some of the techniques of Hatha Yoga, Asanas and Pranayamas and also uh, take care of the other factors which we shall talk in greater detail when we talk about physical culture like diet and uh, sleep and so on. Then integral yoga does not neglect the mind and for that we can use the technique of meditation if we are so inclined but then uh, nothing is compulsory. If a person cannot meditate, does not feel like meditating then he can just uh, stay in a meditative poise throughout. All actions can be done in a meditative poise. And uh, when some of the disciples wrote to Sri Aurobindo that uh, I can't meditate, although I find great comfort in uh, the mother's lap uh, while I'm meditating, so Sri Aurobindo told him, well, that can be your meditation. Or if some disciple said that uh, uh, I just can't sit down quietly, I'm working all the time, so then work can be your meditation. You can work in a meditative pose, so nothing is compulsory at the same time. The person, we, if, if he's so inclined, can certainly spend some time on meditation, going within and uh, uh, leaving some space for uh, inner work, which is a sort of a churning going on inside, in which the person is able to introspect and review uh, to what extent the person is sincerely following what he should be doing on the path of yoga. So uh, mind does not be, uh, also does not have been neglected because the body-mind complex as a whole is important for uh, activity and activity and work are a major feature in uh, integral yoga. Then it gives the freedom to carve out own path. So the seeker can carve out her own path depending on the uh, circumstances and uh, her inclinations. Uh, in fact, that is a great strength, but also can be a weakness because it's not easy to use that enormous freedom that is available. Then, integral yoga, as you would have seen, is not a technique intensive yoga. It means it does not emphasize techniques. Inability to perform a certain asana will not disqualify the person from the practice of yoga. Or inability to meditate does not disqualify the person. And of course, it does not reject the world. It is a highly life-affirming spiritual philosophy that Sri Aurobindo and the mother had. And uh, 
the world has to be embraced and uh, worldly life has to be accepted and we have to work towards a transformation of the world and worldly life. And of course, uh, that is summed up in uh, one of the most celebrated quotes of Sri Aurobindo that all life is yoga. Now, all life is yoga can be easily misinterpreted. Uh, it doesn't mean all life, no matter how lived, is yoga. What it means is all life is a suitable opportunity, all life is a suitable vehicle or field for the practice of yoga. All life gives us an opportunity for the practice of yoga. Using the opportunity is still up to us. So since there is so much flexibility and freedom available, it's quite common for any uh, people to ask uh, that in integral yoga, then what is it that I actually have to do? How do I begin? Or in other words, what is the type of personal effort required? In yoga, personal effort is called sadhana. Sadhana comes from sadhan. Sadhan means a means. A means to uh, achieve something or reach some goal or accomplish something. So what are the means of doing it? Which means what is the type of effort that I have to put in on this path? So we shall uh, now spend some time on uh, uh, talking about the sadhana and integral yoga. And of course some of these things keep be, will keep coming up again and again when we go to uh, the subsequent sessions. So all life is yoga. Let's first see how all life becomes yoga or can become yoga. The three basic elements. One is in the work that we do, the attitude that we bring in. So outwardly the work remaining the same. If we work consciously as an instrument of the divine and uh, realize that uh, it's our privilege to have been chosen as the instruments. The divine has no shortage of instruments and the divine is not in a hurry. And yet we have been chosen to be the instruments and uh, to make us a fit instrument, the divine has also given us the necessary uh, qualities, strengths, unique strengths. Then the least we can do is to put those abilities to good use using this bodily instrument, taking good care of it, of course. So use this body-mind complex, which are our basic instruments, to do the work for which we have been chosen as instruments. What that work is, our unique strengths, as well as uh, the weaknesses, and the circumstances in which we are placed will give us a clue. So we do that work as an instrument of the divine, and since the divine is, has, been cho has chosen us as the instrument, feel that privilege, and yet not be attached to the outcome because the outcome is in the hands of the one who has made us its instruments. And uh, since we are grateful for uh, having been chosen as the instrument, since we adore the one who has chosen us as the instrument because the element of devotion is also there in the work, we are happy to offer the work to the divine. You know, this. what is meant by offering the work to the divine uh, looks like such a sort of a glib phrase, but it's not a glib phrase because offering means that you're doing it out of love. There's no calculation involved in it. And uh, one does it happily and cheerfully and voluntarily. That is an offering. And uh, if it has to be offered to the one whom we adore, we'll put our heart and soul into the work, do it to the best possible ability, do it as well as we can. So that is what uh, makes yoga sorry that's what makes work a part of yoga so all work is not necessarily worship although it said work is worship all work is not necessarily worship but all work can become worship it becomes worship with that attitude the second element in life is that we have to make choices in the course of the work that we do and otherwise otherwise also it's not just in the course of our daily work, which we do as professionals or as a homemaker or as a parent taking care of children. It is not only in that, but even otherwise we have to make choices. For example, you are on the road and one finds that there has been an accident and uh, somebody is lying injured there. We have the choice of uh, helping in taking that person to the hospital or just walking away from there. So choices have to be made. So how do we make those choices? We normally make choices in life 
using three basic tools. One is the emotional part of the being which pulls us towards what feels good. And uh, the second is the intellect which works on the basis of reason. Reason is a tool that calculates. It calculates profit and loss, risk and benefit and tries to do what is on the whole most profitable and least risky. And the third tool which is the most dependable is uh, our psychic being, the dynamic aspect of the soul which uh, speaks to us in a voice which is sometimes called the inner voice. So that inner voice, the voice of our deepest self, that tells us quickly and clearly what the right thing to do is. And uh, it is making choices at that level, that is at the level of the soul or the psychic being, list paying heed to that voice, recognizing that voice, being sure what that voice is saying and then having the courage to act on that voice. That is what uh, constitutes another aspect of yoga which comes into our daily life. I'm going over these things a little faster because these things will keep coming up again and again, particularly when we take up uh, the spiritual worldview and the purpose of life. Then our attitude to ups and downs. No matter how good a life we are living, we don't become immune to the various ups and downs of life, the vicissitudes, vicissitudes of life, including highly traumatic events, a road accident, a failed marriage, a delinquent child, a heavy financial loss or an incurable illness, we become immune to none of these. How we handle success and how we handle failure, treating both as gifts from the divine which have been given to us because we needed them. We needed them for fulfilling the very purpose of life which is spiritual growth. So that gives us a dispassionate view of looking at all the ups and downs and both become opportunities for fulfilling the purpose of life, both become opportunities for spiritual progress. So if we take our ups and downs in this manner, in a dispassionate manner, not only we become mentally more and more calm and at peace irrespective of what is happening around us, our happiness becomes independent of all external circumstances. And that is a great freedom and that is what the Gita has called Samatva or equality. So Samatva or equality goes beyond just a philosophical indifference that well I have seen enough of life now and therefore nothing can shock me. It goes beyond that. It is something where everything is accepted with equal delight. Why delight? Because I look upon it as an opportunity for spiritual progress. It has been given to me as a gift from the divine and uh, it's called, it's called you know, accepting it with prasada buddhi. Prasada you know, is uh, something that God has given us and buddhi is the intellect. So having the type of mind which can accept the type of intellect which can accept everything as prasada as a, a gift from the divine. So that is how we ex accept all ups and downs. So if uh, our work, the choices that we make and the ups and downs of life, they can all become opportunities for the practice of yoga. What else is left in life because that is what constitutes all life. So that's how yoga can become a 24 hour activity and a lifelong commitment. So all life uh, becomes yoga if we are bringing it into our work, into the choices that we make and the way we respond to ups and downs of life. And uh, this is what uh, Sri Aurobindo has said at many places but uh, this is uh, one of uh, those uh, quotes from Savitri where he says it uh, beautifully, thy acts are thy helpers or events are signs. So all the work that we do, our actions are helpers. What are they helping us do? Walk the path of yoga. Or events are signs. Events, various ups and downs of life, whatever is happening in life are signs, are indications, are like, you know, the signs on the road which guide us towards the right path. So acts are helpers, events are signs, waking and sleep are opportunities. So even when we are asleep, we can practice yoga and we shall see that when we come to physical culture. So waking and sleep are opportunities. So what else is left in life? Our actions, all the events and even the time when we are asleep. All these are opportunities given to thee by an immortal power. So they have been all given to us by the divine, the immortal power. 
Why have they been given? So that thou can raise thy pure, unvanquished spirit till spread to heaven in a wide whisper calm. So it helps us lift our spirit up, our unvanquished, that is, spirit that has not been conquered, uh, not been defeated, still uh, responding to these uh, signs and signals and opportunities, so that thou raise thy pure unvanquished spirit till spread to heaven in a wide vesper calm, uh, indifferent and gentle as the sky. It So this spirit becomes both, uh, it uh, rises up because indifferent. Indifferent in the sense of uh, not being affected, not being affected by anything. Uh, indifference, you know, which comes from spiritual progress can uh, be very difficult to understand. But uh, Sri Aurobindo has explained that also beautifully at one place in Savitri where he uses for the rishis and sages who are in the forests, have renounced life and seem to be indifferent to the world. He said that even they are helpful. So Sri Aurobindo leaves nobody out. He allows even that for a select few whom that suits. And in Savitri he describes these rishis who have renounced life and are living in forests and so on. In seclusion, he says they are helping the world through world indifference. So by being indifferent to the world itself, they are helping the world. How are they helping? Through world indifference, by sending to the world from those secluded places positive vibrations which uh, can, in a mysterious way, help the world move to a new level of consciousness. So even they are helping. And so that's what Sri himself was doing for 24 years when he was in seclusion. So, helping the world through world indifference. So till spread to heaven in a wide vesper calm, indifferent and gentle as the sky. It greatens slowly into timeless peace. It refers to the spirit. So the spirit greatens slowly. So once again, it's a process, it's not an event. And the process is one that is uh, uplifting or widening and all, so becoming wider, deeper, higher, all these can be summed up that becomes greater. So it greatens, it greatens slowly into, this is how Sri you see, uses these words. We seldom use great as a verb, but greaten becomes a verb. It greatens slowly into timeless peace. So the spirit gradually moves towards what? Timeless peace. That peace, which is an attribute of the divine, which is timeless in character because the divine is eternal. One eternity has no sense of time. So, how do we reach that uh, type of a state in which the spirit uh, greatens slowly into timeless peace, using as opportunities which has been which have been given to us by an immortal power, opportunities in which we are helped by the work that we do and the events which we use as signs and use wake, waking and sleep as opportunities. So, it is through that that the spirit can rise slowly in that direction where it merges with the timeless peace. Now a little more about uh, the type of uh, sadhana that is uh, there in integral yoga and uh, the uh, guidance that has been given to us by Sri and the Mother. The three pillars of sadhana which are very general in character and leave all the freedom for uh, choose, carving out our own path, these three pillars are aspiration, rejection and surrender. Aspiration, you know, is a desire and it's a desirable desire to move from where we are towards the divine. And uh, what should that aspiration be? That has been exp expressed beautifully by the mother in one of her prayers. Let my aspiration be to know thee and serve thee better every day. So, to know thee, to know the divine and to serve thee. To serve the divine better every day, that is better today than I did yesterday and better tomorrow than I am doing today. And in that process, the mother has said, you know, in the prayers and meditations, many things which are very valuable and that is, one should not be seeking that by knowing the divine and serving the divine, gradually we will be able to get out of our worldly life and just remain in that blissful state which comes from the union with the divine. So the mother 
talks about uh, that blissful state which comes from this realization and the feeling that there's no necessity to work anymore and yet the mother says that why is it that in spite of that i remain involved in worldly activities and i'm being pushed in that direction and then she says that that is also i take that also as a part of the divine will and therefore i we can continue to remain involved in worldly life uh because i have surrendered myself totally to the divine if the, if the will of the divine is that i do not just remain uh, in that blissful state uh, all to myself but get involved in worldly activity and through that fulfill the will of the divine that also is equally acceptable to me then rejection rejection of everything that works as an obstacle that comes in the path of uh, spiritual progress rejecting all that particularly our negative feelings negative feelings have been beautifully summed up in traditional literature through the shadripu or the six enemies the six enemies being kama that is desire krodh that is anger lobh that is greed moh attachment ahankar or arrogance and uh, matsarya or jealousy replacing each of these with their opposites i think we did talk about this a few days back also and we these things will keep coming up again and again uh and surrender surrender which is uh, willful and cheerful not out of helplessness not as a duty but voluntary and cheerful surrender uh which comes from faith so faith sincerity and surrender these three these three go together because without faith total surrender is not possible you might have heard of that little uh, story that uh, there was a person who was uh, hanging by a slender branch of a tree and uh, under him was not just the ground a few feet away but a deep well and uh, he was praying uh, for being saved and the answer came uh yes i can save you but let go but then he was not willing to let go that if i let go of even this slender branch i'll go deep into the well so he could relate himself more to that physical reality rather than to the assurance that he got so that type of a leap of faith where he would let go of even that slender branch is what uh, uh needs faith so that's why faith is important and then sincerity when he was praying he was ready to do everything for the divine but when the answer came let go he was not willing to do it so the sincerity was lacking so faith sincerity and surrender this triplet which you are with the mentions in that little booklet the mother uh is a very valuable combination because without that faith and sincerity surrender never becomes total and of course your window allows for the possibility that total surrender is again a process it's not a uh, not an event it's not a one step process thing you can't just decide to surrender and be totally surrendered tomorrow and uh, once he was asked is surrender the first step in your uh, yoga he said yes and then after a little pause he added and it is also the last so now that indicates that one starts with surrender that is one of the three pillars of sadhana but then the total surrender also comes only towards the end of the path so total surrender is not easy but at the same time it is what leads us to the ultimate goal without that without that surrender it's not possible because uh, it's only when we willfully and cheerfully surrender all our uh, personal will personal ways of thinking which are based on the limited mind till we have not surrendered all those to that higher power that higher wisdom of the divine uh, we cannot uh, merge with the divine so merger requires that we become uh, we identify ourselves with the divine and uh, in that process of uh, at least mentally identifying ourselves we let go of all the scaffoldings which our mind normally provides us so let go of all those scaffolding all those supports in which we feel uh, more secure although on one hand we say that we all our security is in the divine and yet we keep seeking security in all those uh, scaffoldings based on the mind be it uh, holding on to that branch or be it trying to build up a certain amount of financial security or hoping that our children will be our support when we grow old so seeking support in 
all these various types of scaffoldings or be it an insurance policy so whatever it is so these are our scaffoldings to which we keep clinging and sometimes we see them uh, while seeing them as our security we forget that the ultimate security lies somewhere else so let go of all of them they may be there but never forget that any of these things can disappear they can change they may not be available to us like that branch might break any time it's a slender branch so let go so that is what total surrender is about so these are the three major pillars in this sadhana in integral yoga uh, aspiration rejection and surrender and then shorabindo talks in the synthesis of yoga also of four aids along the path of yoga now what is the first one is the guru the guru is important for everybody uh some people say can it be possible to make progress also without the guru because the ultimate guru is our inner guide uh, the krishna within so if uh, that is available then why do we need a guru but then uh, depending entirely on that inner guide comes very late on the spiritual path and to reach there a guru is important so the guru is required and that is why even those who did not need a guru adopted a guru at least for some time rama had a guru in vashishta uh shri krishna had a guru uh shri aurobindo had a guru he also adopted a guru for some time vishnu bhaskar lele shri ramakrishna had many gurus so all these uh, great personages and uh, even avatars have adopted a guru to provide the right example and why that is necessary is because the guru can act as a bridge to communicate the influence of the divine the power of the divine to the disciple because being a, a human most of us have this weakness that we cannot relate directly to an unmanifest formless divine so we can identify more easily as our guide and guru someone who is in a physical form in flesh and blood or at least in the form of a picture or an idol or an image that is easier for us than to depend entirely upon uh, the unmanifest the guru has some concrete functions too and uh, shri aurobindo has summed them up in uh, three uh, moving from the most concrete to the most subtle uh, the first influence of the guru is the word of the guru that is uh, what the guru can teach us through words the knowledge that the guru can give us the second is example by setting the right example for us the guru guides us so the guru should be a role model the guru should give the right set the right example for the disciples and the third is the influence of the guru so he says that the example is more important than the word and the influence is more exam- more important than the example what is that influence influence is a subtle uh, presence of the guru so the very presence of the guru the vibrations it sends to the disciples is itself an aid but at same time shorabindo says that a living guru is not important it's not essential to have a living guru because uh, the word of the guru is available even later on to the disciples his teachings are available the example that he set before the disciples is also available uh, because uh, the life of the guru is known and uh, generally repeated the various episodes from that life are repeated again and again by the disciples and passed on from generation to generation how about the influence the influence of the guru also outlasts the physical presence of the guru on earth and the higher the spiritual uh, capacity and the, sp- the spiritual stature of the guru the longer this influence will last even after the guru is physically no more on this earth and uh, the best example one can give is that of the avatars those who are recognized as avatars like rama and krishna and shri aurobindo uh, calls uh, christ and uh, buddha also as avatars one can see that these avatars who had naturally the highest uh, spiritual stature their influence continues in the world even after thousands of years even thousands of years after they have left the body left this world so their physical presence is not necessary for their influence to continue <clears throat> so 
सो दीज आर द थ्री मेजर फंक्शंस ऑफ द गुरु एंड द गुरु इज बेसिकली अ चैनल बट देन इज इट नेसेसरी दैट द गुरु शुड हैव एन एक्सट्रीमली हाई स्पिरिचुअल स्टेचर डज अ गुरु विद अ हायर स्पिरिचुअल स्टेचर बिकम मोर इफेक्टिव फॉर द डिसाइपल्स एंड शुड दैट बी द रीजन वाई वन शुड बी सर्चिंग फॉर अनदर गुरु हु माइट बी एट अ स्टिल हायर स्टेचर दैन दी वन विच वी अर्लियर अडॉप्टेड a question something along these lines was put to shurabindu by one of his disciples a very intellectually developed disciple dilip kumar roy and the reply that shurabindu gave was that the spiritual capacity of the guru does not really matter because the guru is channelizing only the influence of the divine so since the divine has no limitations the, the influence that reaches the disciple has no limitations because the guru is only a channel he is communicating the influence of the divine of course what is important is that it should be a genuine guru so it is the sincerity of the guru that is more important than the spiritual progress that the guru has already made now these days it's again commonly asked then how do we know who the genuine guru is because there is a proliferation in the number of gurus with the demand is growing also the supply so people ask then how do we know who is a genuine guru very difficult to say some of the easily visible features are that a genuine guru does not make any very obvious or visible efforts to attract more and more disciples or does not seem anxious to get anything from uh, what he is doing for the disciples he doesn't expect not he doesn't expect a financial gain that of course is understood but he does not even expect name and fame worship and adoration these are things that he doesn't demand doesn't expect but then a subtle thing which again is important is that a genuine in the presence of a genuine guru the disciple feels totally at peace so the vibrations that the guru sends the influence of the guru which puts the disciples totally in a state of peace for some time they just forget uh, all their worries and concerns exactly the way a child forgets all its problems when it is the lap of its mother so that is the type of peace if the disciple feels then that is a genuine guru so these are some of the ways it can help us then the second aid chirbindo talks about is the shastra that is uh, what is available to us as knowledge in books and the third is kala that is time time itself is a need which means one should not be in a hurry it will take time no matter how hard one thinks one is uh, on this path so it's not uh, necessarily too much of work which will accelerate the progress the progress will come in its own time uh, as kabir has said you know in one of uh, his uh, couplets that uh, just because you water the plant with too much of water will not make the plant grow any faster so the plant will is programmed to grow at a certain rate and that is how it will grow irrespective of how much water you pour into the pot flower pot so time is important so when the time comes it will happen one should not be in a hurry the aspiration should be sincere and intense but not impatient then utsah or effort shirvindo has used the word utsah not uh, uh, sadhana which is commonly used for personal effort he has not used the word even prayatna which is uh, the literal translation of effort is called utsah utsah you know is not just effort but enthusiastic effort which means you should be passionately involved in it so it's a combination of the vital and the mental it's a combination of the emotional part of the being and the intellect so as in all other worldly accomplishments emotions play a more important role than the intellect because unless we are passionately involved in what we want to do we will not do it anything great and worthwhile and uh, spiritual progress is also something great and worthwhile in fact it is the greatest and most worthwhile thing to do so it applies to all great and worthwhile activities including sp- spiritual progress that we will not uh, accomplish much in these uh, we will not actually be able to achieve anything great or worthwhile without vitality and enthusiasm which are an emotion and that becomes essential because unless we are passionately involved in what we are doing we will not have the strength and the courage and the perseverance 
to go through all the difficulties, obstacles and hardships that are involved in achieving anything great and worthwhile and that includes spiritual progress. So the most worthwhile thing, the most meaningful thing, something for which we are here in this world, which is spiritual progress, is also not possible without that enthusiasm, without that passionate involvement. So while the emotions can lead us astray, they can also be a great collaborator if they are channelized properly. So the important thing is to educate, refine and purify the emotions, not to reject the emotions. And that coupled with the knowledge is what will take us. So at the level of the emotions, passionate involvement and adoration of the divine. And uh, at the level of knowledge to start with Shastra and the Guru and later on maybe the inner guide. Therefore a genuine Guru does not even try to make the disciple dependent on the Guru. When the Guru, when the disciple is ready to use only the inner guide, the Guru is ready to let him go, to wean off. So the Guru is ready for that also. The Guru is very happy to let the disciple wean off. The way you know, Sri Aurobindo was told by his Guru, uh, Vishnu Bhaskar Lele, that uh, when he saw that this disciple has reached Samadhi within three days, which people don't reach in a whole lifetime, he told him that now on you, you are on your own and the word that you heard during the Samadhi is your mantra. So he let him go. So the, that is another important thing. Of, so till then, the passionate involvement, that is the emotional part of the being, adoration of the divine, that is emotional part of the being, using the knowledge available from the Guru and the Shastra, that is the intellect, but then there may come a time when the disciple is no longer dependent on these and can use only his inner guide, but that knowledge still remains important, that knowledge which comes from a higher source, which is not accessible to the ordinary intellect, that source of knowledge still remains important, so that is at the level of the knowledge and then of course action should not disappear, action enlightened by this knowledge and lubricated by emotions or as the mother said, using these emotions as a lever. They act as a lever in all our work, they magnify the effort. So enthusiastic effort, that is what is important. So these are the four aids, the Guru, the Shastra, the time which, is, which it will take, don't be in a hurry and effort, not only personal effort which we call sadhana, uh, but not ordinary effort, enthusiastic effort. Effort in which there's passion and dedication and commitment which gives us the perseverance and the courage. Is integral yoga just a synthesis of the traditional schools of yoga or does it also go beyond traditional yogas? The way it goes beyond traditional yogas is that uh, while uh, the collective element was not uh, forgotten or uh, uh, completely missing from traditional yogas, the emphasis in traditional yogas was always on individual salvation. That the person wanted to, uh, wanted some relief uh, from the normal bondages of worldly life, bondages which uh, uh, lead to all the misery and suffering in the world. You know, Lord Buddha said, life is dukkha, life itself is sorrow. So life is full of sorrows. So the person wanted some way out of these sorrows and therefore embarked on a spiritual path looking for relief from this sorrow and its replacement by the ecstasy and the bliss of spiritual uh, progress and finally merging with the divine. Being in that blissful state uh, in, uh, after merging with the divine. So that is what was considered the goal of traditional yogas. For the first time, Sri Aurobindo and the mother set collective upliftment of the consciousness of the human race as a major goal of yoga. So that is how it goes beyond traditional yogas. So the emphasis was on the collective upliftment of the consciousness of the human race, which in turn will change human nature, which in turn will change the world, make the world a better place to live in. Of course, the unit of the collective remains the individual. But then the individual is conscious that what I am doing is not only for myself, it is also for my surroundings. So each individual by making that progress is contributing one little bit to this collective process and not only because it's adding to numbers but also because each is influencing the next person, the influence that radiates without 
preaching and without saying anything. So that influence is at work. So consciousness is contagious. Consciousness spreads. It catches the next person. And that is how uh, not only infections, but consciousness is contagious. And that is uh, very important to understand because normally we don't, that's the, not the way we these days use the word contagion. Uh, so it's a more easily transmissible and uh, more effectively transmitted than even the Omicron <laughs> virus. So it's, that is what uh, adds to the collective element. And when Shurabindu and the mother talked about this collective element and that uh, uh, this has become important or uh, inevitable, both important and inevitable, because the world is poised for the next leap in evolution. When they talked about it a hundred years ago, probably it was not so convincing. But now so many more are talking about it and one can see it more or less happening. And, uh, and that's what uh, adds further to this weight. And many people have now started talking that the world is going through a ferment and uh, it's uh, evolving and that the world itself is changing. So these are things which uh, Shurabindu and Mother, when they talked about a hundred years ago, seemed rather uh, utopic, but uh, now so many are talking about it as if it's in the air, it's in the atmosphere. And uh, when they, so many have started talking in more or less the same language as uh, Shurabindu and the Mother did a hundred years ago. Uh, so that is how integral yoga goes beyond traditional yogas in going beyond individual salvation to collective upliftment of the human race. <clears throat> so now, uh, let's see, once again, uh, uh, looked at another way, what the major features of integral yoga are. It does not neglect the body, it doesn't neglect the mind, gives the freedom to carve out one's own path. It's not technique intensive. Techniques are permissible, but not uh, uh, obligatory. So no technique is specifically prescribed no technique is proscribed either. Integral yoga does not reject the world or worldly life. It treats all life as an opportunity for the practice of yoga. And the goal of integral yoga goes beyond individual salvation. It's a collective yoga. Looked at yet another way, uh, it is open to all. The inability to do a certain technique does not disqualify the person from the practice of yoga. It accepts all other schools of yoga picks up important elements from them. It accepts all techniques but insists on none of the techniques. It accepts all parts of the being. So it does not reject the emotions. The uh, body, the emotional part of the being, the intellect, all these are accepted as tools for helping us evolve. And all these parts are also incorporated in the yoga because all these parts have to be transformed. So including the physical. So, it leaves out no part of the being as being unworthy of helping us in the process and doesn't leave out any part of the being out of the goal. So the goal is not just to merge with the divine, but to transform each of the parts of the being. It accepts all life. All life is yoga. And it uses all life as an opportunity for the practice of yoga. And it changes all life. The person starts even much before the person reaches the goal, the person starts finding that the person is now much clearer about which direction to move in, how to use life for spiritual progress, and life becomes more, not only more and more meaningful, it also gets filled with more and more love, peace, joy, and fulfillment. And it reaches out to all. It is not confined to the individual, it, is, it reaches out to the world. So, you know, you can see all, all, all in all these. So, it's... That is one way you can say it is integral, doesn't leave anything out. So integral yoga is integral or total in ways more than one. Now let's have a look at a few questions which might help us uh, become a little more clear and uh, recapitulate some of the things that we have talked about. Is this statement true or false? In integral yoga, asanas are acceptable but not indispensable. Yes, that's true. They are acceptable, but at the same time, one can do without them if the person is unable to do the asanas. That will not disqualify the person. So the statement is true. How about this one? Integral yoga is easier than other yogas because one does not have to renounce worldly life. This only makes it look easier, but actually does not make it an easy. No yoga is easy. Why it is not easy is because uh, staying in the worldly life also means that there are more temptations and distractions and uh, obligations. And... Uh, 
therefore uh, it can become more difficult it also means more trials and tribulations when the person is put to test more often uh, and therefore uh, to call it easy because of that is not right that is not true but however it does make everybody qualified for the practice of yoga that is what it does so nobody is left out everybody can practice because uh, living in the world not only the person can practice one can use worldly life itself as the vehicle for the practice use it as an opportunity integral yoga has maximum similarity with which of these hatha yoga raja yoga tantra yoga or yoga of the gita we seen its maximum similarities with the yoga of the gita integral yoga has a unique technique for performing the asanas or performing pranayamas or meditating all of the above none of the above it has no unique technique and therefore none of the above is the right answer doesn't prescribe any specific technique or a path which exactly has to be followed in the same way by everybody in fact there's total freedom to carve out your own path and there's no emphasis on any of these techniques so none of the above integral yoga accepts asanas as an essential part of yoga an important part of yoga the favored route to enlightenment or a concession to popular demand well if everybody is, feels that yoga is asana so might as well include a bit of asanas also it's not a concession to popular demand at the same time it's not an essential part of yoga but it is an important part of yoga because it can uh, help us improve physical fitness to some extent also mental fitness in a way that is far uh, more effective than some of the other activities like uh, jogging swimming and cycling so therefore it is an important part of integral yoga but it's not an essential part if a person is paralyzed and cannot perform the asana still the person can practice integral yoga and of course just this physical activity will not lead to enlightenment by itself and therefore it is not the favored route to enlightenment that of course is ridiculous so integral yoga accepts accepts asanas as an important part of yoga integral yoga is technique intensive successive practice of all the traditional schools of yoga lopsided development of the mental part of the being compatible with worldly life of course it is not technique intensive successive practice of traditional schools of yoga is not a synthesis nor is combination of different schools of yoga a synthesis that we saw and some people feel that uh, it has a highly intellectual orientation because shurabindo and the mother did have a pretty intellectual approach to spirituality so does it lead only to an unbalanced lopsided development of the mental part of the being no it leads to development of the physical vital and mental all so it leaves out no part of the being all parts of the being develop through the practice of integral yoga in a balanced manner so it's not a lopsided development of only the mental part of the being and it is compatible with worldly life of course so the correct answer is d in integral yoga asanas are necessary but not sufficient necessary and sufficient neither necessary nor sufficient none of the above i let's take up one by one asanas are necessary but not sufficient they are not necessary and therefore this one is not right necessary and sufficient of course they are not necessary and the question of sufficient doesn't arise it would mean that if one does the asanas then nothing else needs to be done yoga has been practiced so it's this can't be true neither necessary nor sufficient of course it they are neither necessary nor are by themselves asanas sufficient so this is true none of the above of course then it's not right because see we have found the correct answer in c they are neither necessary nor sufficient suggested reading in this book a primer on yoga integral yoga forms uh, chapter 6 the title is integral yoga the all in one yoga and uh, the most comprehensive work straight from the master is the synthesis of yoga and uh, then you know when shurabindo was in seclusion he was replying to letters from disciples in which they asked questions this has led to now four volumes of letters on yoga which is another precious resource uh, for integral yoga because that then uh, you know gives answers from the master himself to the type of questions which the disciples those days had and would have even now because the questions don't change the disciples keep changing but the questions and the difficulties remain the same 
now those are four volumes and everybody may not be able to read four volumes of integral in yoga you may not have the time and the perseverance to read go through four volumes each of them 7 to 800 pages or something that much time may not be there here is a compilation which has also been made from those and the letters have been arranged subject wise in a uh, compilation called Shurabindo's Integral Yoga Methods of Teaching and Practice. So that is another very important work as a guide. Here are two lovely books, uh, very manageable in size, just about uh, 150 pages each by Larry Sidlis, who is a PhD in psychology and uh, currently lives in Oroville, although he's uh, of American origin. Uh, and he was one of the uh, important persons, you see, who helped uh, uh, the progress and growth of uh, a center in California, Sri Sadhana Peetham at Lodai in California. But then uh, about 10 years ago, he moved to India and has spent time in Pondicherry as well as Oroville. He has uh, given us these two beautiful books. One is Integral Yoga at Work. This is uh, uh, based on the uh, interviews that he conducted with 16 people, I think, in different walks of life and asked them how in their uh, everyday work or professional work integral yoga has been helping them and how they have been seeking some guidance and aid from integral yoga. The second one is Transforming Lives which is again a very carefully selected compilation of uh, uh, largely a compilation but very organized, well organized compilation from the works of Sri and the Mother on uh, how one can practice integral yoga. So Integral Yoga at Work and, integral and Transforming Lives. These are two beautiful books from Larry Sedless on Integral Yoga. Thank you. So we'll uh, begin with the questions in the chat box. The first question is, it was mentioned that we should do everything as a service to divine. Suppose we like doing work, say official, and don't like doing other work, say household work. How can we do both things equally sincerely? Well, I mean, this type of situations call for a certain amount of sincerity as well as pragmatism. Sincerity in the sense that uh, sometimes when you say that this work is not suitable for me or I am not made for it or it uh, uh, is not in keeping with my temperament and therefore this is not the work I should be doing, we are uh, sort of um, uh, looking in our sobhava or our temperament an excuse for something which we do not feel like doing at the vital or emotional level. So firstly, I mean, we should understand our swabhav much better than we normally do. So that is the sincerity part. But then it also calls for a pragmatism in the sense that uh, we cannot be always doing only what we think are we are most suited for or what we are made for. There will be things in life which may not be wrong, which may not be bad, but at the same time which do not interest us equally. And therefore, the other important thing that has been also said uh, is that we should work without preferences. So on one hand, yes, we should have a preference where it's possible to have a choice for the type of work for which we are uniquely made. But at the same time, we should also show no preferences, especially preferences which originate in the vital. Uh, so those preferences should not be shown. Uh, it, this applies not only to everyday work, say official work as compared to domestic work, it also applies to even the official work that we do because within that also there will be combinations. For example, a person enjoys teaching, but as a teacher, the person also has to examine, assess students which he may not like. He has to do some administrative work which he does not like. So there will be things which the person may not like. Or the person may feel that teaching itself is not my inner calling. My inner calling is something else. But then while that person is involved in teaching, he should... Uh, Treat as if that is what is what the divine expects from him and has been given to him as a vehicle for fulfilling the purpose of life. And th just because he thinks that that is not what I am eventually made for should not 
distract him. That is what the mother has called a temporary occupation. That we might have to be satisfied with a temporary occupation and if we handle our temporary occupation itself in the spirit of Karma Yoga, one day we, will, we are sure to discover our true inner calling and be able to do it. For example, Sri for him, getting involved in the freedom struggle was a temporary occupation. But then he, when he was in it, he was fully immersed in it and uh, gave all of himself to it and the passion and dedication with which he handled that uh, involvement in the freedom struggle is unparalleled and incomparable. But then through that he discovered eventually his inner calling which was to be a spiritual master and that's how he moved to Pondicherry and for which again circumstances were created to make that possible. Next question is how we know when we need Guru? Well, I mean, this question uh, in a way sort of uh, 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 has been answered because we don't have to wait till we uh, feel that we need a Guru. Everybody needs a Guru. But uh, the person uh, may be so involved in worldly activities that, and everything may be going well. And the person therefore may not have felt consciously the need for a guru. But if the person consciously decides that I want to give a new direction to my life, whether it is because of a traumatic event or whether it is because something goes wrong with life or the person starts feeling a void in life and emptiness in life, no matter what the reason is, if the person feels that now my life leads a little change and a change towards what is generally called the spiritual path, then the person knows that I should look for a guru. And uh, it is believed that uh, when the person is in that state, not only the person will discover the Guru, the Guru will uh, also discover the disciple, which means that somehow the uh, Guru will find the disciple and the two will be connected. Those circumstances will be created, which will lead to the meeting of the Guru with the disciple. And the circumstances can be very bizarre. The, uh, infinite variety. For example, one of the early disciples of Sri who came to be known as Amal Kiran, uh, he uh, finally turned to Sri after the trigger for him came in the form of uh, a newspaper article and that article was on a, a bit of the piece newspaper uh, in which a shoe which he purchased from the market had been purchased. So the shoe was wrapped up in that uh, newspaper and when he unpacked the shoe, he started reading the article on Sri and that is what it took him there. So it can be bizarre circumstances which are created for the disciple to be able to find the Guru. Well, that are uh, all the questions. Okay. So we end today's session. Tomorrow we will have the graded approach day 4. And we end with a collective meditation. Thank you, everyone.